So this is the reason why you are here at the uh, at the webinar. The other thing that I was saying is, is that I'm not a statistician. My background is in operations and supply chain management. And what that means is that I understand that forecast errors don't uniformly translate into cost implications and responsiveness because capacity occurs in chunks. Orders, a lot of times order uh, occur in quantity discounts. So what I want to do in this, in this webinar is really look at how best we can improve overall forecast accuracy, but also performance. And so what I wanted to do uh, was talk about some key things in the time that we have. Uh, the first is principles of forecasting. We know that following some very simple basic rules really helps in terms of accuracy. Two, I want to talk about combining disparate data uh, from different sources that bring different kinds of information. And last, I want to talk about segmenting and dissecting data, which um, really allows us to really take advantage of the 80-20 principle. We understand that most of the results come from fewer items. And some of the keys are really into knowing how to segment and dissect the items that we're trying to, to, to forecast. And so it's really being very clever in terms of the data that we have to get the biggest impact. And then I'll conclude, uh, uh, conclude with some key takeaways. So why forecasting? Of course, we know that forecasts provide a significant competitive advantage. Um, and as I had mentioned, it is much more so uh, today than ever before. And uh, I think a lot of the difficulty comes from, first, that competitiveness of global markets today is, um, is more than it ever was. We see very short cycle times. We see rapidly shifting uh, global markets. And all of this creates a lot of uncertainty, unlike we've ever seen before. This uncertainty, by the way, uh, translates into the fact the data uh, is not always available, or the data that we do have is not reliable. So we have this high competitiveness. We have this high level of uncertainty. And the last issue is that we also have this hugely advancing software capability. Technology and software are unlike anything that we've ever seen before. And I see companies that are sometimes a little bit overwhelmed with the dizzying array of options that are, that are out there. And so we know that we've got to do something. Good forecasts, of course, help us correctly estimate demand, anticipate disruptions. But they also help us identify new markets and trends and forecast risks and um, uh, market implosions and, uh, and all of that. And poor forecasts, of course, are going to mean lack of responsiveness, excess inventory, all that kind of stuff. So what do we do? How do we improve accuracy? Well, as I mentioned to you, uh, we do have this incredible technological capability today. And please, I want to uh, underscore that you cannot run a world-class operation without using technology and software. You can't do that. However, um, what I see, what I'm seeing with a lot of companies is there is a tendency to abdicate all knowledge and responsibility to the software. And they really work in tandem. Uh, technology and software enhances good practices, but it doesn't replace them. So we need a basic understanding of forecasting principles that helps us use the technology uh, in the best way possible. Please remember that. Again, I see so many companies that invest uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in software, and they just simply surrender completely to the software. To get the best out of the technology and software, you have to have good processes in place. You need to understand some basic principles and to know how to, uh, how to, how to do forecasting. So um, what we're going to look at is the importance of following establishing forecasting principles. And by the way, there are so many forecasting principles. I'm only going to give you a few that I think are going to be key in terms of uh, um, helping navigate uh, this, this really challenging landscape. And we'll talk about how to combine data from disparate sources. In particular, I'm going to give you two categories uh, that are important to look at. And then we'll look at some ways 
in terms of segmenting and dissecting data. And before we begin, let me just apologize again for the technical difficulty, and I hope it doesn't take away from the learning experience that uh, you know, hopefully you'll get, uh, you'll get here. So let's start with the first principle. Again, it's not the only one, but one that I think is important. And that is that forecasts are more accurate for groups of items rather than for individual items. Their uh, forecast accuracy is much better on the aggregate than at the lower level. In fact, at low level, data is usually very irregular. And forecast errors at the low level often are many times greater than errors from forecasting aggregated series. So for example, you can't have the same accuracy, say, of global PC sales versus sales of media tablets in one particular market. And a lot of times I'll hear executives say, you know, well, we're pretty good on the whole, but we don't do as well once we get down to, let's say, the DC level. Well, of course not, because forecasts are more, ac more accurate for groups of items. I'm going to tell you in a moment how you can leverage that principle to improve your forecast accuracy. But just to illustrate what I'm talking about, I just quickly want to show you three diagrams that show data at first the most aggregate level and then disaggregated. So you can see what we're talking about when we look at this irregularity. So here to start is Ben & Jerry's quarterly sales of, um, in, in total. And uh, we're looking at quarterly sales in total. Yes, there's uh, jaggedness, some up and down, but overall there's an upward trend. We could look at it, we could probably forecast that. Let's disaggregate just a little bit, and here we have diamond ring sales. And this is monthly time series. You can see that it's much more irregular. In the next slide, we have soft drink product sales weekly, no less. You can see that it is very noisy, so it becomes much more difficult to, to forecast. One of the ways that we can leverage this is to use a top-down forecasting approach. It's a simple principle. And one way to do this is to forecast groups as a whole and each product separately. And then what you do is allocate the group total to the individual products proportionally. Now, of course, higher level could be countrywide or product family, lower level individual region or item level. And you could use the same, te the same technique by location. But one trick that you might want to experiment with is this higher level doesn't have to be a natural product grouping like a product family. Rather what we find is by experimenting with different product groupings at the aggregate level and then using a top-down approach can actually be very effective and software can help you with this. So some product groupings might be Items that are promoted together could be complementary products. It could be items that have similar seasonality, for example. And again, what I would recommend is that you experiment with this aggregate grouping and then try various top-down strategies to see what gives you the best results. You know, we found that sometimes very odd product families, if you will, or product groupings, uh, that use this top-down approach end up giving us overall better, uh, better accuracy. But this strategy is going to leverage this, this principle as opposed to chasing uh, a lot of noise at the lower level. So please don't forget that. The second principle is the importance of cleaning dirty data. Now what we see today is we have so much data, but most companies that I find are data rich, and information poor. A lot of them don't even have the infrastructure to absorb the information that they have in order to actually make effective decisions. There is this rush to take all the data that we have, you know, plug it into a software package and just get, uh, you know, get some results out there. But the fact is, uh, is that most of the data is dirty. I would encourage you to always, always question the quality of the data that forecasts are based on. Some of the most common things are missing data values. I mean, obviously, you can't submit or, or substitute a zero in there. Uh, some judgment and interpretation comes into play. There are trading day adjustments. And I only have a few, by the way, here. You know, trading day adjustments occur when you have monthly data across multiple years. 
uh, the number of trading days in a particular month across many years can substantially and significantly uh, impact um, the, the, the value of the data uh, for that month. And it's really surprising if you don't do a trading day adjustment, uh, if you just do comparison across years for the same month, you will really have garbage in, garbage out. So make sure that something like trading day adjustments is done. Then, of course, there are outliers and special event adjustments. Um, we all have promotions, special events, occurrences, such as a snowstorm delaying a shipment, and so forth. We have to make sure that uh, the data set that we're working off of is clean. And, and usually the way this is done is you have your original data set, and then you create a second data set that's been clean that you work off of. Obviously, you don't discard uh, the information of you know, what the outliers were, what the impact occurred, or what it was, say, on demand. Uh, but you don't just follow this, uh, this data set. You have to clean it. Things like constant versus current price data, it might seem very simple, uh, but it's very, very surprising how often some of this isn't done. And especially today, that we have so much data, there is this tendency to forget to make sure the data is clean. You know, we get so zealous and excited and say, oh, we have data. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, is it clean? And two, is it relevant? Is it reliable? Which leads me to the uh, third principle. And that is that sometimes there is no data. Uh, this is very important to keep in mind today when we have uh, a lot of new products. Uh, also, for example, we have a lot of events that will occur. I mean, just think of the, uh, the tsunami in Japan and look at the electronics industry, just one case in point. And uh, in that example, if we just looked at um, activities in the electronics industry in Japan prior to tsunami, we certainly couldn't extrapolate that following the tsunami. So the question here is, sometimes there is no data. And it's very important to look at the data that you have and say, uh, is the historical data reliable? Is it clean? But is it also reliable and representative of what the future uh, is going to hold? And recognizing that maybe there is no data. So what we do in that case is we use other strategies. We look to historical analogies. We might identify like products and study their pattern. We could use a structured analogy process that allows us, in a very structured format, to use demands for like products uh, and, and create a whole new set of forecasts. And there's some wonderful software capabilities, Forecast Pro included, that enable you to do this. The key thing here is to, um, uh, to understand and ask yourself, you know, is there reliable data? Uh, should we go ahead and look to like products rather than trying to force fit the historical data that might not represent what is going to hold into the future? The other principle of forecasting is to match method to the data. And you might say, well, that's pretty obvious. But there's a few things I want to say here that are important. Remember that all data has pattern in it plus randomness. And of course, we can have just a level pattern, say a mature product, um, like table salt. It doesn't really go up very, very much up or down. It just kind of fluctuates around a mean. We can have trends, seasonality, cycle, and so forth. And we can have layers of, of patterns, one on top of each other. Um, it's important to follow the principle of parsimony. And unless you're going to get greater explanatory power, you do not want to go to a more complex model that you need. So let's say that you only have trend in your data. Uh, you don't want to select a model that's automatically handling trend, seasonality, and cycle. And that's important to stress because, again, we have so much technological capability, there is this tendency to say, well, why don't I just get you know, the biggest gun out there that I possibly can that's going to handle everything? Trend, seasonality, cycle, you know, why not? And why do I have to you know, mess with uh, just the model that can handle trend? or just a model that can handle seasonality. Why don't I just pick the one that can do it all, and I don't have to mess with any? And I'm telling you the reason is, is that you are going to get far, far better accuracy 
if you understand the data pattern that you have, and again, the software uh, that we have, again, Forecast Pro, can help you do this, so you don't have to really guess on what the patterns are, but understanding what the pattern is and making sure that you pick a model that can address that pattern and no more. Again, principle of parsimony, you don't want to get a model uh, that can handle more than what you need because you're going to compound errors by having to compute many different parameters. So keep that, uh, uh, keep that in mind. So what I've shared with you here are just four of the many principles that we have. Uh, they may seem simple, but I can assure you that following them uh, is extremely valuable in terms of improving your forecast accuracy. The other strategy, the next strategy, that I want to talk about is combining disparate data. And you know, uh, there's a lot to talk about with each of these areas, so I try to just hit the highlights of these subjects and hopefully they can be helpful. When we're talking about disparate data, we're talking about uh, different sources of information. And there are really many, many different sources of information. I picked here two uh, broad categories of data and models that are very different, uh, that I think are very useful if they are combined because they have complementary strengths. Uh, and again, this is not limiting to just these categories, and we can go into more details here, and unfortunately we don't have the time, but I wanted to hit the highlights. The two broad categories are first qualitative or managerial forecast, the second are quantitative, analytic. The first category are judgmental, they're subjective. They're based on opinions. The second are objective. They're based on mathematics, statistics. They both have their strengths and weaknesses that I'm going to share with you here in a moment. And I'm going to show you ways that we can combine them uh, to get the best results out of, their, uh, out of, out of the forecast. Managerial uh, strengths. They're highly responsive to the latest changes in the environment. They can include uh, a lot of insight or soft information that's difficult to compensate um, and to include one-time or unusual events. You know, I can give you a lot of examples. Um, most notably, I think of a company uh, some years ago, Belvedere International out of Canada. Um, they make um, lotions, for body lotions. And I remember when the SARS epidemic hit in Toronto, they literally made a, a momentarily overnight decision to switch production on their, on their, the entire production process from lotion to hand sanitizer completely. Um, it was simply understanding that the SARS epidemic was hitting. Uh, this is that inside information. This is the latest information. Uh, it would take a long time to model that, right? So they had to make a decision. This is where the managerial judgment comes into play. Unfortunately, managerial forecasts have weaknesses. Um, and I know that all of you are very familiar with these. Uh, you know, human cognitive limitations, limited attention span. Uh, I bet all of you, even after the hour of the webinar, are going to be thinking about other things and getting a little tired. That's just because we're human. Short-term memory. Uh, difficulty understanding causal relationships. Um, we have biases like lack of consistency and optimism, wishful thinking, and political manipulation, which, is co which are completely normal. Um, the issue here is that managerial forecasts do well. Uh, there are some caveats that I'll share with you in a little bit, but one of them is to keep the scope of what a manager is working on or forecasting small. And the reason is because we have uh, a limited attention span and our scope, our ability to process, just by nature of being human, is limited. Uh, managers do very, very well provided, again, that the scope of what they're working on is relatively small. And by the way, this is where the 80-20 principle is going to come in, because um, if you have managers working on the things that are most important and automated, automate the things that are less important, you can be much more effective than actually spreading yourself to them. But we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a little bit. Quantitative forecasts, as far as strengths, well, they're objective. They're consistent. They can process large amounts of data, consider many variables and complex relationships. And you know this 
to be uh, tour today than, than ever before. This is where the big data analytics comes in, where we can understand through manipulation of data causalities that we never thought existed and use that to forecast and to really understand, uh, again, uh, relationships we didn't even know were there. But of course, quantitative forecasts do have weaknesses. They're slow to react to changing environments. They're only as good as the model and the data they're based upon. And do remember that. They are only as good as the model and data they're based upon. Remember what I had talked about with regard to cleaning dirty data. So uh, always question that. And of course, they can be costly and time consuming to model, the soft information, and you need to have technical understanding. So uh, as far as managerial and quantitative forecasts, each method has its strengths and weaknesses, and the best forecasting method is one that integrates both approaches. This is where combining comes in. And there are different ways that we can combine uh, these two uh, you know, disparate sources of, of information. I'm going to show you three fairly quickly. The first one is mechanical combining. And mechanical combining basically takes uh, the managerial and quantitative uh, uh, forecast and combines them in some kind of a statistical way. I've seen this work in some, some companies where managers make their forecasts independently. They don't look at the quantitative forecast. So they don't really anchor on a number. They use their own knowledge and experience to generate the forecast. Quantitative forecasts are generated separately. And then you can statistically combine this to get a final, uh, a final forecast. Now, this provides improved accuracy. It is objective, but the issue, the problem here is it may not provide the user with a sense of ownership. And I can tell you from my personal experience, a sense of ownership is really important. You know, uh, the ability to buy into a forecast, to believe in it, to have the team buy into it is extremely, uh, extremely important. And we all know of the many consequences uh, when we don't have faith in what the numbers, uh, numbers actually are. So I think, I personally think, that's a bit of a shortcoming here, although statistically it does provide improved, uh, improved accuracy. Another method is to use the management uh, managerial input into model building. So for example, you would use managerial knowledge and opinion to identify patterns, to select variables, to define parameters. Uh, the manager might have greater insight, for example, as to what the trend is going to be doing uh, that might not necessarily be reflected in the history, and that might be used to create a better quantitative model, and then, of course, generate the final forecast. This method is least subject to bias. It's objective, but it is time-consuming and slow to react to change. I mean, think about the, 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 the Belvedere example, and there are numerous such examples where so much has to be done on the fly. And unfortunately, the way the business environment is today, that's the reality of it. So it's a question of, well, how do we work with the reality of the context of this very complex and rapidly changing landscape and incorporate the knowledge that managers have? And, and that's really the third approach. And it's managerial adjustments, managerial overrides. And, and I know all of you are familiar with them because they're so much used in practice. And this is really where we get the quantitative forecast, and we have the managerial opinion that comes in and makes the adjustment, um, generate the final, the final forecast. And there are different ways to do this. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But let me just say that it is by far the most popular method in practice. It enables rapidly reacting to change. 91% of companies report using it. And it has a high potential for introducing bias. Now, remember, we talked about the bias. So that's the shortcoming. So to look at ways of how to do this effectively. And it does provide the user with a sense of ownership. And I've said to you, my opinion is ownership is important. So there's good and bad with it. And we have to figure out how to do this effectively. Now, what I'd like to do at this point is hand the presentation over to Eric just for a few minutes to illustrate how this can be made in Forecast Pro.
Okay, thank you, Nada. Um, what I'm going to do is Nada has outlined three different ways of, of combining qualitative and quantitative information. And uh, I thought I'd just sort of illustrate it a little bit uh, using Forecast Pro. So the first example on the screen is we have a statistically based forecast. That's that top row. It's also the green line on the graph. Actually, the red line on the graph, excuse me. And um, we have also, in this case, demand planning. And actually, let me um, pop up a different one here. Sorry about that. Um, so again, what we have is a statistically based forecast. This was generated from a quantitative model, like um, exponential smoothing or perhaps a regression-based model. And we also have a management forecast along in this row labeled corporate. So again, illustrating what Nada was speaking about, that we have sort of a separation between a statistically based forecast and one that's based on more qualitative information and, and it's coming separate from the process. Along the bottom here, I've defined a different row. And this is a combination. And in, in this simple example, it simply averages the two. But perhaps if there was a track record involved between the different forecasts being combined, we'd, we'd get a little fancier in our weighting scheme. But again, the main, the main point here is this idea of taking quantitative-based statistically generated forecasts, which as not as has told us has certain advantages, and combining it with the softer information, uh, in this case a management-based forecast, to come up with the final numbers uh, along the bottom here. Now, the second method uh, which was discussed was the idea that management, rather than coming up with their own forecast, would have input into the actual forecasting method so that they might be uh, helping us to define what models would be appropriate to use, what variables would be appropriate to come into a quantitative model. So I'm not going to illustrate this per se, but I'm just going to point out again that most software packages, and certainly Forecast Pro is included amongst them, uh, will have a variety of different quantitative approaches to forecasting and would allow you to specify a model um, and to build a model. And again, if we're the managerial input to the model building process uh, is really direction and helping to identify patterns, select variables, et cetera, this is how we'd enter that information. And then the third, uh, which uh, as um, Nada has pointed out is actually the most popular, is judgmental adjustments. And here what we have, and I've, I've done a slightly more general uh, example, is we start off with a statistically based forecast. So that's our top line here. And this you might think of as, say, like an SNOP meeting or something like that. Our second line is labeled demand planning. And uh, you can notice that there are a few changes here. So if I click on one and I read this little comment, it says this has been increased by 10% for a planned promotion. So the demand planning team has come in and already come up with a forecast probably prior to this meeting. Uh, this particular example also, um, we have a customer supplied forecast along the bottom. So here we have the, uh, the Stuff Mart has provided their own forecast for this item. And you'll notice this next row called management. And the idea is we're going to go into this meeting and we're going to talk about the different forecasts, what the statistical forecast brought to the table, perhaps the information that the demand planning team brought to it, um, certainly the, the information that the customer came. And then as always, you know, the bottom line is that management gets to call the shots. Uh, here we might notice that the customer forecast is substantially higher than our current forecast. And maybe I'd go in here and say, you know, let's, let's push this one up. We'll put it up to 45,000. Um, and let's add a comment to, uh, we'll say increased uh, to meet customer uh, expected demand. Okay, and we'll commit to that. And then again, our final forecast will reflect these changes. So this is just a simple example of, again, a process where we're going in and making managerial adjustments to a statistically based forecast. Uh, in this case, again, a little more general than just, just management because oftentimes different teams will bring different things to the table. So the demand planning team may know about supply constraints or other issues in the supply chain. Management may know some strategic stuff. The customers, of course, it's always good to listen to. But again, we're bringing different pieces of uh, 
both quantitative and qualitative information to bear in establishing the final forecast. Uh, adjust in the presence of domain knowledge, and again, domain knowledge is experience that managers just gain just being on the job. Uh, we really don't know, you know, when does one gain this experience? Is it five years, 10 years, 20? Uh, but we do know that managers who have worked in a particular industry, who have experience, have insights that just someone who's brand new just simply doesn't know. And, and we found that managerial adjustment with domain knowledge can actually improve accuracy. Um, managers with higher understanding of market conditions, they generate better adjustments. And we've also found, studies have found, that adjustments without domain knowledge can reduce accuracy. So we want to make sure that there is some experience, that, that the managers know the industry a little bit. Again, what that is, I can tell you, as a professor, we don't really know, you know when does that point come when one has reached domain knowledge. And I suspect that would greatly vary by industry. But we do know that some knowledge of industry is extremely important. Uh, just to give you an example, an idea of how important domain knowledge is, um, how we need judgment to interpret, just think about this. If we just use blind extrapolation of past data, let's say, uh, and these are actual numbers, uh, if 165,000 people were living in Las Vegas in 1980, and then we looked at the numbers, 260,000 in 1990, then 480,000 in 2000. Now, can we assume a trend? Well, if we just looked at the blind data, probably would, right? But we all know uh, what this has looked like in Las Vegas, in Nevada. How about this one? In 1910, a Bell Telephone statistician said literally this, every woman in America will be employed as a switchboard operator. Now, clearly missed automated switching. And I wanted to just share these examples with you to show you why domain knowledge, why knowledge of, and judgment of managers is important because it provides interpretation. You can't just blindly follow the numbers. Uh, when else to adjust quantitative forecasts? Adjust in situations with high degree of uncertainty. Quantitative models cannot deal with discontinuities or pattern changes. Um, Experienced managers were actually found to be superior than quantitative models when estimating when a change would occur, the onset, uh, duration, uh, the magnitude of that change, what it was going to be, what that, think about the, uh, various disruptions, disasters, and, and we are so much more prone to this today because we have global supply chains that we didn't see 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, this is affecting virtually every facet of business. So understanding, is this a significant event? How long will it last? How will it impact our business? A model cannot do this. Similarly, adjust when there are specific and known changes in the environment. Compensate for specific events that are not captured by the model. Certainly things like advertising campaigns, the late shipment, and again, any of the many disruptions that we have out there. And then adjust to compensate for past events that are not expected to reoccur, labor strikes and, and, and so forth. So just keep in mind that, that when we adjust, we need to have some domain knowledge. And there has to be reason as to why we are, we are doing it, as you saw in the example with Forecast Pro. Also, how to adjust. Now, you saw how you might do this in a software context. But I wanted to add to that that it's very important to structure the adjustment process, to decompose the process into subtasks. This could be very simple, by the way. It could be decomposing a new product into trend and a seasonal component. Um, it could be computer-aided, as you just saw. It could even be pencil and paper. The point is that you want to decompose. And we find that when we decompose, uh, this entire process, we tend to do a whole lot better. So let's say that you're thinking about a new product forecast. Rather than just forecasting demand in total, you might have a better idea what the trend is going to be versus, say, seasonality. You might want to break those up. And again, you can use software to aid you in this, or of course you can use pencil, uh, pencil and paper. Two, you might want to consider method of data presentation. So we find that, for example, graphical presentation is better for trend, tabular, otherwise, 
Graphical oftentimes is better for short term, tabular long term. Uh, there are differences whether we have macro or micro data. And um, we're seeing this taking so much more hold now with software analytics and dashboards and presentation. But the bottom line here is what I want you to remember is pre presentation makes a huge difference. When you look at as a manager and you're trying to make a managerial assessment, if you will, I am telling you that how you will perform will have a great deal to do with how you visually and physically look at this data, whether it is a string of numbers or whether it is some kind of a graphical presentation. So please keep, keep this, um, this in mind. And third, document all adjustments. And really software has made it very easy for us now that can keep track of this for us. But we want to keep record of adjustments made and reasons for adjusting so we can go back to it. And what this actually does is it serves as feedback and really aids learning. So as managers, remember our, our attention span is small. Uh, if we can keep a pretty small scope of what we are adjusting and we can keep records and see why we've made the adjustment, we're actually going to get a whole lot better at it. And we're going to really understand uh, a little bit more clearly which events had an impact and which ones didn't, and really what the, what the magnitude of that impact, uh, impact is. And the last item here in how to adjust is to monitor forecast accuracy for all adjustments and really for everything. Um, measure adjustments with formal forecast accuracy measures. Obviously, you're going to gain knowledge and see how you're doing. And software obviously can help. But I want to at least tell you, when you're monitoring, at minimum, at minimum, use two metrics, one that measures your overall error, something like a make, and definitely have at least a second metric that measures bias. Bias tells you something different, like uh, MPE might be a, a metric you might use. But at minimum, if you're only going to use two measures, pick one that measures overall error, error and one that measures bias, uh, because they will provide you with different kinds of information and guide you uh, as, you, as you move forward. And the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, in the webinar is to segment and dissect data. Uh, all forecasts are not the same. And you really get 80% of the results um, from 20% of your, of your items. Uh, we know this, uh, uh, Pareto's principle. And so the best strategy is to segment series and use different approaches to each segment. And you can segment in many different ways. I mean, you can segment based on ABC analysis. You can segment based on sales, promotion, uh, degree of importance. Um, one way that you might want to consider in your segmentation is the item I have on the screen here, which is forecastability. And forecastability is really a, a measure of how easy uh, something is to forecast, the ease of of how, uh, how, you know, what our accuracy might be and how easy it is to forecast. And there are different ways that we can measure it. Uh, the most common way is the coefficient of variation available in virtually every software package. And coefficient of variation is simply standard deviation over the mean. And there are rough rules of thumb, but generally a CV under 20% um, gives you a pretty stable pretty stable data, over 50, unstable. And a lot of times we'll say, you know, 100% or over CV is unforecastable. This is extremely important. Uh, the reason is, is that by segregating or segmenting out uh, stable versus unstable uh, series, your overall performance is going to be much higher. So for example, stable, um, you can probably expect to get pretty good forecast results. Those that are highly unstable, even unforecastable, you might want to think about a different business strategy for those. So for example, uh, it may be where make, maybe you are in a uh, make-to-stock environment. Well, maybe for certain customers that have a really high CV, you might say, you know what, we're just going to go to a make-to-order in that case because we can't afford having the extra inventory given the high variability of what the demand is. So you might want to think about a different strategy 
keeping in mind you're just not going to do very well. Also, if you lump the stable and unforecastable or unstable series, uh, the, 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 the hard to forecast essentially contaminate those that are easy to forecast. So your overall performance is going to be so much more enhanced if you can do this separation. One thing that you might want to do is something, um, uh, something like this. I have here which model for which data, and this is uh, this is uh, you know not hard in hard in stone or set in stone, so you can vary this. But what I have is stability on the x-axis, and I have low CV and high CV, and then I have degree of importance and low and high. So, for example, items that are low CV, low importance, these are probably going to be at least part of your 80% of items you're forecasting. You probably want to just automate those. Do them in an automated mode. A good choice here might be like something like time series, because time series models you can easily automate. You know, and, and if you think about in a situation where you're forecasting hundreds of SKUs, this might be a very good strategy. Uh, remember that as managers, again, you have very limited attention span. You don't want to waste your energy on things that are low importance and easily forecasted by, like, let's say, simple time series. Once you get into, say, high CV. For low importance, you can still automate, uh, again, depending upon how important uh, it is or what the, what the degree is. You might want to do some combination. Maybe here you could do a mechanical combining that might be easier. And then once you get into a high degree of importance, you can see with a high CV, high importance, I have just put managerial forecasts. If there are a high importance and high to forecast as a manager, you probably want to handle those personally, or maybe do the combination model with adjustment or override. So this is just one taxonomy I wanted to show you, you know, one way that you can segregate which items to forecast and how. But of course, there are different ways to, uh, to do this. Another might be to consider segregating series by stability and maybe data pattern because we had talked about data patterns, and you might have better luck in forecasting some patterns versus others. So you could segregate stable, unstable, and then say maybe trend and, and, and seasonality. This kind of segregation, uh, this process tends to improve overall accuracy. And I would say if I had to tell you right now what the trend is in forecasting, it's finding clever ways to segment and dissect data. Um, the way we handle these times of change, this very difficult forecast environment, in saying, well, how, do, can, how can we be smarter about this and use our ingenuity in a very effective way? And that way is through segmentation. Another extension of this that I want you to think about is to consider disaggregating the variable to be forecast, uh, specifically is to look at the series you're forecasting. And you may want to separate it out into um, uh, forecastable and unforecastable segments. What I find is that a lot of companies have pretty stable periods and then have fairly volatile time periods. If you can uh, identify, uh, and you can use the CV, and there are different ways to be able to do this, if you can identify the segments that are stable, you can automate those then switch over to a different forecasting model, perhaps even uh, um, managerial judgment during periods that are volatile. And remember that managers with domain knowledge are good at forecasting um, the onset and magnitude and duration of change. So again, a strategy too is when you're looking at the series you're forecasting and time periods, you could come in and say, well, we know that we are, we are entering uh, a disruptive period. I mean, think about uh, think about the you know political, the upcoming political election. I mean, it is certainly having an impact on a lot of the markets. And again, it, I mentioned the tsunami and the various disruptions that we have. Knowing your business, you might have an insight as to when this period of change might come in and when it might end. And looking at again the single item you're forecasting and saying, well, not only are we dissecting the entire data set but also the item, the, the series we're forecasting, and maybe uh, automate during stable periods, jump in 
during more volatile time periods. So what I've tried to do in this time period, and again, I apologize for the disruptions, and I very much hope that I was able to hit some of the important issues in forecasting, uh, some key takeaways. Do not blindly apply technology and software. Please, I see this a great deal because we have such amazing software capability. Again, there is this tendency to just go, well, let the software do it. Let it enhance what you already know your knowledge coupled with current technological and software capability is the best strategy. Understand and follow established forecasting principles. Uh, this is again very important. I'm oftentimes surprised how many companies have lost sight of those uh, in the face again of this overwhelming technological capability. The forecasting principles are well established. They work. So make sure you know them and follow them and understand and work with today's software capabilities. That your organization has to have a forecasting process in place. It needs to have a rudimentary understanding, and then you overlay on top of that one of these amazing software packages in tandem. This is what gives the competitive advantage to companies today. A few other takeaways. Combine data from disparate sources. We operate in very complex environments today. And we need to gather information from different sources. We cannot rely just on one. There are many ways to do this, but the most disparate, if you will, are qualitative and quantitative forecasts. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, exclusive. So don't use one to the exclusion of the other. And combining often gives, of course, the best forecast accuracy. Uh, and last, segment and dissect your data for best results. Time permitting, uh, experiment with a variety of forecasting methods and a variety of segmentation strategies. Play with this on your software package and then use this information moving forward. So remember, one size does not fit all. Um, and thank you for attending the webinar. And again, uh, I hope you found it useful. Um, now what I'm going to do is hand this over to Eric who will talk just a little bit about some upcoming training workshops. Thank you, Nada, and, and thank you for presenting the webinar today. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. I do, before we uh, break for our question and answer session, I would like to just uh, say a few words about our next upcoming webinar and some resources that are available to you on, on the Forecast Pro website. Um, so I do want to mention that uh, we do have the, the webinar series. It has a live webinar once a quarter. Uh, it also has on-demand webinars that are available on the website. They're free, uh, so, and it's a great way to learn about topics that you, that you uh, pertain to forecasting. So we'd encourage you to visit our website and, and take advantage of that. We do also offer uh, product training workshops for those Forecast Pro users out there. We can deliver them both uh, either on-site or remote-based via WebEx. And if that's of interest, then I'd encourage you to, to uh, learn more about that as well. And the next slide, please. So the examples from today's webinar actually used a, a new version of Forecast Pro Track, which is coming out very shortly. Um, if you would like to learn more about Forecast Pro, of course, we'd be happy to tell you about it. And one of the best ways to learn more about the product is to request a live WebEx demo. Um, it's free, and we can even use your own data to make it more interesting. But we'd love to show you how the software works and how it can help improve your forecasting process. If you are interested in learning more, you can actually just send us in the chat box. If you send us a request, we'll have somebody get in touch with you to schedule a demo. Um, and as always, there's a lot of resources on the website, so we'd encourage you to explore that as well. And the next slide, please. Our next scheduled uh, live webinar is coming up on J Thursday, January 17th. Um, it's entitled, What Now? How to Proceed When Automatic Forecasting Doesn't Work? And I will actually be presenting this uh, webinar. And the, the theme here is there's an awful lot of forecasting that is using automatic time series based forecast. In other words, forecasting based solely off the past history, extrapolation of trends and seasonal patterns. Um, this webinar really is going to concentrate on cases where that does not do a good job and how do we proceed? What types of methods can we use, for instance, when we don't have adequate data to project from the past? 
or when there's not the same continuity between the past and the future that's required for automatic approaches. So again, it should be uh, an interesting talk and I think offers a lot of pragmatic approaches to improving your forecast and I hope you can join us for that. So at this point, what, I'm, what I'd like to do is to get to some of the questions um, that people have posed throughout the, the, the uh, webinar and I'll be asking them of Nada and she can reply some answers and I'll start with this one. Um, let's scroll down a little bit. So the first question is, how many years worth of data do you recommend to generate forecasts and is it actually possible to have too much data? Great question. Um, I cannot and I will not answer that as far as how many years specifically and I think that the, uh, the person who asked the question is right on track when suggesting that can you have too much data. Uh, you can and I, I'll explain why. Um, we are in a period, a, a, a very, very rapidly changing time period. Now granted, some industries are much more volatile than others. What you need to do is look at to see, uh, when you look at your historical data, were there uh, significant changes throughout that time period that would render periods of, of, of the historical data inadequate? Uh, generally, if you're dealing with uh, seasonal data, uh, you want to have multiple years. So ideally, we would like to have, uh, in an ideal world, at least two or three years of seasonality if we can. Uh, similarly with trend data. But I would be extremely careful with um, having a lot of data and getting to the point where you have too much data simply because chances are as you go into the past, a large part of that data is going to be invalid or misleading. So when you're building your model on the history, and, and you, you all know I'm certain that we take a part of our history and we actually use it to calibrate the model before we move forward, it could be that that period uh, might not be representative of the future. So I would look and given the knowledge that you have, uh, be very careful that that data in fact does not have some major disruptions that would have occurred. Okay, thank you. And for our next question here, um, when measuring forecastability, do we concentrate on a specific time window or do we concentrate on the entire series? Um, I would actually concentrate on both. Um, what I would do is I would look at stability first of all in, to in total. So you would have a sense that say series A has this level of coefficient of variation versus series B. That's going to give you a sense of what that time series looks like. At the same time, um, if you remember, I had mentioned that a good strategy is to identify periods of stability and periods of volatility. You can easily do that uh, with some of the software packages and to actually look at when variation occurred and did not. And based upon that, you can then measure um, what the stability is, and it could be quarterly, it could be monthly. So again, you want to do both. And then you want to do an analysis to see when uh, the data pattern moves out of one degree of stability into the other and make those computations. Thank you, Nada. And actually a follow-on from a, a different uh, attendee who's asking, at what granularity um, is the CV calculated? I've seen it calculated at all, all levels. Now, uh, that's actually a very good question because um, you're going to have to keep track of these values over time. You know, I'm asked all the time, we have a map of X, is this good or is this bad? And my answer, a very honest answer is, I have no idea and neither do you. And the reason is, is that these are all relative measures. So for example, let's say you're going down to uh, a skew level. Obviously, your volatility is going to be higher. Your CV is going to be higher at a high level of granularity than at aggregation. But if you track it over time, what you're going to find is that uh, relative to itself, it will change or it may change. And this is where your understanding and insight might come in in terms of switching from one model to the other. You can also then compare that against items at the same level of granularity. But comparing items at 
a, a very low level versus those that are highly aggregated isn't a fair comparison. So you need to be very much aware of that. And this is, again, true when we're looking at uh, uh, forecast error measures. It is extremely important to track those and evaluate performance over time because you will then have a better idea of how you're doing. And then if you're able to get some industry statistics or even those of competitors, now you have a much better idea. But just looking at that number by itself, it is entirely uh, uh, unfair and not correct to say this is good or, or bad. Okay, thank you, Nada. Uh, we have time for two more questions. And uh, the first one is, what is the best way to measure and quantify savings that can be achieved by increasing forecast accuracy? Um, there are actually some equations that we've developed that look at translating the savings that would come in to, say, um, uh, reducing inventory holding costs or improving customer service. And at least in the operations environment, those are the two things that we're able to quantify. Um, if you're interested, you know, you have my contact information, I'd be happy to send you uh, an article or, um, or a link to what that equation might, might look like. But again, you can directly translate it over into inventory holding cost and, uh, and customer service metrics. Um, in terms of in terms of what that is, and we could actually measure both. Okay, thank you. And our final question, um, and I do want to remind people, if you have submitted questions that we haven't uh, addressed during the live Q and A section of the webinar, uh, we will be emailing you uh, responses to your questions after the webinar is concluded. But our last question to take live: Do you have a recommendation as to a bias measurement to use when comparing different forecasting approaches? Uh, I personally just simply love the MPE, um, uh, mean percent error. Uh, that's the easiest, and if you're tracking, say, MAVE, MPE is the simplest bias measure. Uh, it just simply tallies up the errors and uh, considers positive and negative errors. And what happens at the end with MPE, you basically end up with a sign. And you know whether you are over forecasting or under forecasting and how much. And so, you know, what can happen is if you just track MAPE, for example, if you're just looking at, 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 at MAPE in, in, in totality, it's going to, or, or something like, like MAPE, it is simply going to tally up your errors, and it will give you a sense of what your overall error is. MPE, by contrast, is going to end up with a sign and give you, give you the direction. It's my own personal favorite because it's very simple, available on virtually every software package, so that's the one that I use. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this will conclude our webinar uh, 